It's different. Hey guys, this is Bruce and welcome to Combo Courses Podcast. And today I have something a little bit different, something special for you guys. Another cybersecurity professional is going to join me. And I just thought this would be a great opportunity to pick his brain and see, like, get another perspective of somebody who's in this field so you can get an idea of what it looks like from the inside. And I'm hoping that this will be uh, helpful to somebody who's like maybe in the help desk or maybe maybe they're in they're already in cybersecurity, but they're trying to level up in their in their in their career path. And so now I'm bringing on another cybersecurity professional to give his take on cybersecurity and actually tell you about his path and give advice also on what certifications to get, what experience you should have. And I think that it's just really valuable if you have somebody, a mentor, somebody who can tell you, hey, look, this is what I did. Here's what you should do. You're, you're going this direction. Maybe you should think about going this direction. So that's why I'm having another professional on here to get so you guys can get another idea of how to do this. Now, I'm going to go through his um, his background and then and then uh, then we'll open it up to questions like any questions you guys have him and I'll kind of tag team any kind of questions that you guys may have. And if you're interested, if you happen to be a cybersecurity professional or somebody who happens to be an IT professional and you would like to actually help other people, just like we're doing here today, just just by sharing your own personal experience, then uh, please send me a, an email and, and, and maybe uh, I can invite you on the show as well. And um, it's just going to be a casual conversation. You know, this is not scripted, not edited. I mean, I did put together uh, like some questions I would like to ask him just so so I'm not, you know, getting lost in this because I rarely do this if you guys have been watching me for a while. But I do have some questions queued up that I want to ask him. And his name is Ryan. Um, he's got an extensive background in this. He's kind of coming from the same vein as me. He's a he's a vet and um, and he's got a lot to say about this. So he, he's been jumping on some of my um, some of my lives from time to time and being and giving great input. And that's the kind of stuff that is really helpful to, I think, this entire community. And so without further ado, let me have Brian uh, Ryan on here. Sorry, I messed up your name, man. <laughs> hey, Ryan, how are you doing today? Good, Bruce. How's everything with you? Not bad, man. Not bad. Um, just uh, sharing my weekend with you guys. Um, I, I, I really like doing these things. And, and thank you for volunteering your time um, to, to come here and help out other people. And... Um, it, I understand you're in the ISSA here locally in Colorado? Yes, I am. I'm here in Monument, um, physically located in Monument, uh, north of Colorado okay. Springs. Um, work out of DTC in Colorado Springs, depending on what, what, what I feel like doing that day. Um, but bounce around between all the different bases. Uh, we're, uh, I'm working with a company that's uh, building out a prototype for uh, Space Force, uh, doing data transport as a service. Um, okay. So we're we're connecting up a lot of different sites and uh, and just moving bits, you know, ones and zeros from place to place, and that's our entire raison d'être. You know, the, our our entire existence is getting um, stuff from point A to point B. How long have you been doing IT and cybersecurity? Well, I mean, I was in the army as a communications officer, so if it had a plug and if if it plugged into the wall or it had electricity running through it, I was responsible for it some way somehow. Um, even the coffee maker to a degree. Um, and so I've always had my hands in IT, uh, dealing with that, uh, you know, throughout the career, um, you know, doing deployed networks you know, wherever we needed to go. Um, so I was always in that since I graduated college in 1997. Um, but I didn't really call myself an IT professional until much later. And I, don't, I still don't to a degree, um, but I kind of hopped from that uh, into and I had a couple of. I had some I had some stops and, and restarts along the way after I left the army um, to get where I am at, I am today. But um, yeah, I've been I've been doing a lot of uh, either military work or um, supporting defense contractors since 1997, 25 years. Wow. So I've worked a lot with the army, especially the Signal Corps. I worked as a contractor with them. Actually, when I was in the Air Force, we walked we worked uh, very closely with the army super super sharp um it guys in there super sharp cybersecurity guys regardless of what the air force says about the army some of the sharpest i mean actually many of my mentors were from the army actually and many of the smartest people human beings i've ever met were in the army so you know and, and I, I i i gotta say like I, I just remember i was building a, a building and 
um, Afghanistan uh, for one of our one of our battalions, and the the Air Force guys came in, um, the Air Force uh, contractors, um, not contractors. I'm sorry, the 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 Air Force guys were coming in to install comms into the building, and they said, "Hey, yeah. we need a we need a map of you know where to put the drops at." And I so I just quickly fired up PowerPoint, and I just did whatever I could to, to support what, what their request. And the guy came out and he's like, sir, this is not NIST standard. This is not. <laughs> <laughs> Freaking Air Force, man. Oh, my God. So, yeah, man, Army Army gets shit done, man. Like, uh, that's one thing I would say about, like, they would get stuff done. They, they weren't playing around. Like, when I, was in the, when I was in the Air Force, they were like, look, we need this network. We would do, we used anything we could to make that thing work. And we did, we got it done. So that's one thing I've always respected about the Army. Um, so Ryan, what degrees and certifications do you actually have? Um, okay. So uh, when I was young, very young, um, went straight, to, straight into college out of high school and had visions of chasing bad guys down the highway as a Utah highway patrol officer. And I thought, you know, that'd be pretty cool to drive the Mustangs and the Camaros at high speeds. Um, so I chased, uh, criminal justice degrees. Um, I had, you know, I just remember walking in and my beginning my senior year, um, and to put in paperwork, you know, whatever, you know, get my classes straight. And the, and the registrar lady's like, hey, if you pay $25 today, you can get an associate's in criminal justice, uh, you know, at the end of this quarter. Right. And I was like, okay. So I paid the 25 bucks, got the associates, and then turned around and uh, four months after that, graduated with a bachelor's in, in criminal justice. It was just one of those nice. ones where I had all the I had all the requirements met, so I got two degrees for the price of you know basically twenty five dollars. Um, but you know I, I was in ROTC at the time, and I knew that I wanted a stable job. And, and military pay back in nineteen ninety seven for you know <laughs> young, a young officer was pretty pretty dang enticing. I it was better than zero, yeah. um, and so I I, I knew I was going to aim for the military. Um, I was in a pretty competitive class, and so that wasn't a guarantee at the time. Um, but, uh, you know, th things worked out, and I got on active duty as a, as a young officer um, and never really looked back uh, straight into the Signal Corps um, doing, you know, tactical networks and yeah. um, that that whole business for, for many years. So um, but while, while my career was starting to wind down and uh, 2012, 13. I mean, I was starting to realize where where my position was and where you know what where the cards were going to lie. Um, was working on my master's of arts in information technology management. Um, so I finished that uh, in 2014. Um, I retired from the military uh, from the army out of 2015. Um, and you know, um, I remember. Uh, going back a, a couple of years before that, you know, I was a brigade mm -hmm. at six. Um, I was a commu senior communications officer in a, in a logistics unit. And I kept sending my, my young soldiers to um, the certification classes. And I didn't have any idea what, what they were about and, and whatnot. And I, they kept coming back and failing, you know, it was like one of those boot camps where you start on Monday and, and the soldier was supposed to be not, you, you weren't allowed to touch the soldier. You weren't allowed to task them. You weren't allowed to do anything. Um, and they kept sending them to net plus and sec plus so they could be system admins and they could have rights and do things and get their jobs done. And right. they kept failing. And so I said, Hey boss, man, uh, I want to run in and take one of these courses and I want to treat it like I would treat it if I was sending one of my soldiers. And so I want to, you know, sequester myself. And, um, so I went to and took a net plus in 2010, um, and learned a ton. Um, and it was yeah. surprisingly taught by an English professor, um, but that's what he, he did on the side, you know, for his, his side gig and his side hustle was teach these boot camps. Yeah. Um, but what was astounding to me at the time was he said, okay, here's, here's our schedule. You're going to show up every day at 8 a.m. On Monday and Tuesday, you're, I'm going to release you at 4 p.m. Right. And then on Wednesday, I'm going to release you at 3 p.m. But I'm going to give you an optional hour, extra hour class at, at three o'clock on Wednesday that no one has to sit through. Right. And, and we're just going to talk about question construction. We're going to talk about how to design a question and how to answer a question. Right. Um, and then on Friday, you're going to come in at 9 a.m. and you're going to go to the testing center and you're going to sit down on a computer and you're going to take the exam. And if you pass, you pass. If you don't, you don't right. sort of deal. And so he told us that 
we needed to be going home in the evenings. You know, obviously you're being taught the material during the day. But if you go home in the evenings and you just take the practice exams that are provided by CompTIA, you know, on the disc that comes with the Net Plus book. Yes. You will pass the exam on Friday. If you do exams for two hours every single night, you will pass the exam. And so I listened to his how how he told us to approach the class and did exactly what he told us because I figured he was the expert. And so we got to Wednesday, but the, the, the important part of the, this little caveat or this little story is that we got to Wednesday and about ha- 3 p.m. rolls around and about half the class stood up. And they said, well, if it's optional, I don't have to be here. And they chose to, to walk out of the room. Right. And something told me I needed to sit and listen to this because I was, like I said, I was approaching this with an open mind. Um, and I sat there and, and wanted to hear what he had to say. So he walks through, he had been helping CompTIA design and construct questions for probably a number of years at that point, num- right. you know, many years. He he said, okay, here's who I am. I'm, a, I'm an English professor. I hold this master's degree, this, this master's degree. Um, I've been teaching college for 25 years. Um, I, I am certified in question dis- construction, question design. Oh, question. right. Yes. And so what he was doing was teaching us and, and teaching us how to approach questions and how to read them and yeah. how to eliminate answers, you know, and then at the end of the day, if you, if you have no idea, just select B. Um, <laughs> but um, he, you know, what it ended up being was, was probably one of the most useful hours of, of my adult life, um, realizing that there is an art and science to question construction, question design, and that there is an art and science to answer development. You so, know. so in other words, just to back up a little bit, yeah. he, he wasn't a professional in IT at all. He wasn't a yeah. network professional. He didn't, he just knew how to answer questions logically. He knew how to, he was helping CompTIA write their te- exams and he was a certified instructor. And so he, all he, all he had to do at that point was learn the material, master material and teach and teach it. Like any, any teacher who's been teaching for a very long time can probably do is pick up the material and internalize it, learn it, learn it themselves and then present it in a logical fashion. So you could, if you could sum up what you, that critical thing that you learn from that English professional who, who would mastered taking tests? What, what would it be like? What did you learn that helped you to this day on taking tests? Slow down, read the entire question, eliminate the parts of the question that don't matter. Like right. Bobby, Bobby, Susie, CEO, CFO, maybe, maybe CEO, CFO, because those are roles, you know, maybe just make sure to keep them straight. But Eliminate information that's not necessary to the question and then determine what the, the real point of what they're trying to figure out is. Exactly. And then and then work from eliminating the, the answers that you know are incorrect so that you get down to the two one or two answers that you suspect are correct. That's right. That's exactly what I do. <laughs> yep. Wow, wow, that's incredible. So you you went through, you passed the network plus, and then from there, what made you decide to do the security plus? Well, a couple of things is that I was approaching retirement um, and I was working through my master's at that time. Um, and I owned um, the one of the signal universities on one of the posts um, down south. And um, I didn't like on the day-to-day operations, I literally signed for the building. And so um, I was responsible for it. And so I knew the guy that that ran it pretty well. Uh Um, And so I'd asked him, I said, hey, you know, I heard that um, you have a bunch of old Security Plus vouchers that are about to expire. He goes, yeah, yeah, I got a bunch. So, well, may I have one of them, please? And and he, you know, he's like, yeah, absolutely. He said, I can't put you in any of the classes, you know, because of being a little bit too high and a lot of different reasons. Um, but if you study material on your own, you know, you can have the voucher. I was like, well, that's, that seems like a pretty good deal to me. Um, and so I remember just digging into it and starting to, um, and this is where I developed my methodology and my, my approach for how to 
approach certifications is by taking the, the, the material that you, you can find online and then fleshing it out and rewriting it, rewriting it, rewriting it into to, to things that you can understand. Um, and then picking up habits that you may not normally have, um, like find um, apps for your phone. You know, we spend, what, 25% of our, our life in a line somewhere, whether it's at Walmart, whether it's at, um, uh, you know, waiting for food at McDonald's or whatever, what have you. Uh -huh. um, when you're waiting in line, pull out your phone and answer one to two questions or three questions if you can get through them. Um, just running through practice exams and and learning uh, what type of questions you may face for your exam. And so it's yeah. all about time management at that point. Um, mm -hmm. And it, you know, so I, I did pass Security Plus um, when I did get in to take the exam, and it having the Security Plus immediately um, set me up for my first job out outside of uh, outside of the military. Um, I was interviewing with a, with a large aerospace company uh, in Dallas, and um, I happened to mention, I oh yeah, by the way, I do have my Security Plus, and so I I can fill you know a, a, an IAT role. It's a very um, marketable certification. Yeah. And so at that point, I'm now uh, retiring from the military, net plus, sec plus, and a master's degree um, in wow. information technology management. I'm very, you know, lucky to get there, um, but it, it did take take me a couple times to get a couple of courses correct and master's and getting that getting that going. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, and uh, to back up on what you're saying about studying for the Security Plus, um, you said that you you go through it and you uh, you put it in your own words so that you can understand it. And then you also said that you, you, you time management, you figure out any time that you have free time, you, you can crank out your phone, start reading through questions and answers. You could actually, what I do a lot is uh, audio books. If, I, yep. if there's a way I can listen to it while I'm driving or something like that, or where I'm cleaning the house, I'll just listen to the book or listen to the material over and over again. And, and that just, it reinforces what I already know, and it's it's uh, repetitive to where I, I start to know it. So that's those are other techniques you can use. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if, if you've got two hours in a car per day, that's two hours you could be studying through osmosis, you know, by, by listening to either YouTube channels or, or podcasts yeah. or because um, there's all sorts of material on YouTube. We all know that there, yeah. are, there are there are good and some of them are not great, but um, or they're not what you may need to internalize a lot of the information. Um, but there are a, a ton of different people out there producing content and putting it out on, on YouTube for you to find. And so if you, if you've got a 30 minute commute one way or, or an hour commute or whatever it is, that's time that you could be utilizing to help develop yourself is what I, what I kind of think about it. Yeah. And now I see that you also have the uh, CYSA. Now, wh what was your journey to get that one? <laughs> so, yeah, after I, after I uh, left the military, uh, I worked for the aerospace contractor for a couple of years. Um, and then I happened to get into a uh, government oh. services job um, with the Air Force on, on uh, here in Colorado Springs. Uh -huh. um, and I just, you know, I felt the job was uh, I, I don't want to demean the, the organization or the job because it's important. Um, I just, there, I felt there was more out there. Um, and so, um, also my, my mother-in-law had at the time had some things that she was dealing with. And so I took, I went back to my old army unit that I, mm -hmm. I had left from and took a job back down South with that organization. Um, learned a ton, uh, managed to accomplish a ton, did a lot of data normalization efforts. Um, basically, uh, we had a certification tracking system that the Army used to have a contract for, um, and it was a giant database. And mm -hmm. my old organization was responsible for basically half of the active operational force um, with a number of uh, divisions. And it, it tracked their cyber awareness, their cy cyber, you know, their um, cyber what what a cyber awareness tra training and all that stuff yeah. your annual cyber stuff that you have to do like don't don't click on bad links you know whatever and right. different units were were having problems maintaining a common standard and we were just nothing ever aligned you know if this unit said that they were 90 percent, i i go in and i i see that they're at 80 percent or whatever mm -hmm. um fix that system for everybody um 
by it was I remember it being during that big cold, cold snap that knocked out power in Texas 2021. Yeah. Um, I just I was here in Colorado during the time. And so I would just sit and work until like 1 a.m. at night um, just on this entire database. That was a don't ask. Um, I didn't even ask for permission. I just did it. Just completely rebuilt the database, rebuilt the queries. Um, while for, you know, the fort down in down south was closed. Um, right. So, you know, I, I just completely rebuilt it. Um, and I just remember presenting it to all these senior signal officers and uh, at the time and and it was you, even though it was on a on a team's call you could hear a pin drop in the room not that it was one of those one rare instances where somebody had instead of bringing a problem for them to solve and saying you know making them look bad or feel bad that maybe that they they hadn't done things properly i had brought them a problem with a solution and they didn't have to do a thing and wow. and that was that was pretty powerful because basically I know I normalized forty four thousand user accounts, um, and you know rehomed five thousand abandoned user accounts that were stuck at an echelon that they needed to be brought down to you know the lowest level, um, and so completely revamped the database and then the army canceled the project I think a year later. <laughs> um. But anyway, so yeah, the CYSA, that was my next certification. Um, right. I was, I had been without my family for a number of months at this point, um, living um, back in my old hometown or my old haunt. Um, and I got a call from a recruiter, wanted me to come work shift uh, back in Colorado for a significant pay jump. Um, and they said, well, and, and the only thing is you just have to get within three months, you have to get this CYSA certification. I'm like, okay, you know, big pay jump. I get to return back home where, where, where my kids are. And, um, and so I jumped at the opportunity. Um, I felt bad about abandoning, you know, my old boss, um, after only a couple of months, um, but I needed to get back to Colorado and, uh, and do the right thing. Right. Um, you know, by my family. And so I get there and uh, everything in the military is lightning fast, right? Uh, in terms of getting your accesses and your, your privileges and your accounts and whatnot. Um, I didn't have access to, to the commercial internet. I was locked in a, in a, in a network that was closed off from the rest of the world. Right. Um, and so I started to, uh, I've, there were a couple of study guides people had migrated on, on onto that network. Um, and so what I did was I completely took all of the material that um, were in those study guides and put it into Microsoft Teams and just rewrote every single question, you know, nice. all the way all the way through. And so that every single question from the different um, study guides were contained in one location on, on Microsoft Teams, not Teams, uh, uh, OneNote. Um, but anyway, the, but the point being is I, I was taking all this material and rewriting it once again. Um, not necessarily rote memorization, but not quite not rote memorization. Um, and so that was another, that became another tool in my tool bag that I added to, to studying for certifications. Now, what happened was on April 8th, 2021, I went to the exam center and took the CYSA um, and passed eight points. I passed by eight points, but I still passed. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was feeling pretty, uh, pretty good about myself. And I went back, I remember going back to the office. And by this point, I'd, I'd gotten a couple of different ID cards that I needed and um, accesses that I needed. And I was playing around on the internet. And I, when I say playing around, I mean, literally playing around. I was going to auction sites that I shouldn't be on, um, looking at things that I shouldn't be looking at. Um, and I was thinking about making a sizable purchase when I realized I just passed an exam in three weeks. <laughs> and so now I've got three certifications and I always wanted the CISSP. And, um, you know, I, kind of half-heartedly studied for it but i didn't i thought it was a mountain so insurmountable that so impossible yeah um i just didn't have 
I guess, faith in myself at the time that I could actually pass it because I was scared of losing, you know, that, that amount of money. Yes. But then I realized that I was about to spend that amount of money on a toy. And so I said, okay, I closed out all my windows, all my tabs on my browsers, opened up the website to, to try and see when I could possibly schedule a CISSP opened up that one tab and I realized very quickly that on May 1st, 2021, they were going to advance to the next generation of, of exam. And I'd been reading the books um, on and off, but not seriously. And so I said, well, if I wanted to take this, this generation of the exam, um, you gotta hurry up. Yeah, what was what was the latest possible date I could take that? Right. And that ended up being April 28th. So if you're keeping track in your head, that's exactly 21 days, exactly three weeks. <laughs> that's crazy, man. So I did it. I purchased wow. I purchased the, the exam. Um, now, mind you, when you're an analyst, your number one job is to keep the the chair that you're sitting in from hitting the ceiling. That's your job. Um, of course, I'm being you know I'm joking about it, but you are you're paid to be there to respond to an in incident or to be able to pr be prepared to respond should something arise. Right. Um, and so you do have a lot of of uh, many times you do have a lot of leniency and 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 um, and what you're actually supposed to be doing. Um, if you're, you can keep your monitoring activities separate and, and especially on, on our side of the ball, um, you have a, a lot of, a lot of access to different, um, screens and screen time. Um, and yes. so you can, mul you can multitask, uh, fairly well in analyst roles. And that's why analyst roles are great for young upcoming, uh, Absolutely. professionals who, who are also studying for for a, a degree or a certification it gives it gives them the time especially at night when when things start to to power down and and quiet down because yeah. analyst them. work is usually shift work so it it, it could be a mid shift where you're working in 3 a.m hours something like that so right. anyway, go ahead i didn't mean to interrupt you yeah no 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 exactly but you're exactly right um and so i took all the night shifts i told everybody mm -hmm. I said, hey i'm gonna take the night shifts and i'm just gonna i'm just gonna go chase this certification and that's what i did i lived ate, ate breathed cissp um i udemy was was my friend um during that time I, I, great act. it's I, a great resource I managed to get a couple of good, good uh, practice exams out of there, um, and that's all I did was just study, 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 and lived, you know, lived in the in the, in the exam. You were correct in one of your podcasts recently. One of the more recent um, shorts that you talked about is your number one resource is that ISC two uh, PBOC CISSP uh, CIS book. And the practice questions that come with it, yeah, but you have, you, but you really should supplement um, all your stu CISSP study material with up to, um, I, I want to say about fifteen hundred practice questions. Yes, I think fifteen hundred is the bare minimum to start. Yeah, that really helped me out. Those questions, it just any questions I could find. And so, with you know, you, you know, with CISSP, um, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but there's always going to be two questions that are that are wrong one is clearly wrong one is mostly wrong and then you're you then you're left with two options yep <laughs> one that's one that's right and then the one that's more right or more right correct. yep and so um you know i went into that that cissp exam 21 days later and um i walked out three hours three uh, three and a half hours later I felt like somebody had been beating me in the back of the head <laughs> with a baseball bat. Yeah. Yeah. Mine took, uh, man, it was a six hour test. I took five. I was like the last second to the last guy out of there. I was so stressed out. I had a headache. I was sweating. I was felt sick to my stomach. I thought I failed it. 
Yep. And uh, I mean, I, it turns out I was just beating myself up. I passed it. It was fine. You know, I overstudied. I way overstudied. And I just kept second guessing myself and everything. And ultimately, it didn't matter. I mean, even if I had failed it, I would have just kept retaking it. There's no way. You only fail if you quit. So right. I was going to keep retaking it. So you passed this thing in 21 days of studying. I did. You went in. That's awesome, man. <laughs> and you know what? That was probably the most valuable thing. That moment, that day was probably the most valuable day in my entire career. I, I, I believe it because that was the one thing that I thought was impossible. And I accomplished it pretty much. I'm not, not, not to say I didn't have help and support, but just on my own. Yeah. that's And now I see you have, you have uh, the CC, which I want to talk to you about, because I don't mm -hmm. know anything about that. These, you've got the CGRC, which yep. you have a book on. If you guys want to check out the free book that Ryan wrote, just check it out in links in the description. He's got the ISSMP, which used to be a concentrate of the CISSP. He's got the CASP, he's got the CYSA, he's got Security Plus and Network Plus. Out of all of these certifications, which one would you say is the most has been the most useful to you? Like it it the information in there aligns with what you actually have done. Like it was just really impactful to your career. Well, okay, let's separate it because I Yeah, that, that's I think you 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 know where I'm going to go with that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so the the one that's obviously the most impactful in terms of getting noticed by recruiters is CISSP because yeah. that is the gold standard. That's the one that everybody looks for. Um, and and search words and the, the people that do the data analysis and, and build those beautiful graphs, they'll show you that recruiters are searching for CISSP number one. Yeah. The most relevant, uh, based on my, my current line of work, is the CGRC. And I had people, um, and maybe we know some of them together, um, you know, question um, why I would go get CGRC after CISSP. Um, it was because uh, I, I just same. had a chip. I had a chip on my shoulder, but also I wanted to prove that I was um, well trained, well certified, well experienced in a particular lane. I want. I wanted to to take my fo my my career and focus it into one area and yeah. i felt by chasing cgrc i, I would do that um cgrc and um and casp i i did not pass them on the first try um and when when i failed cgrc uh the first time i took a year and that's when i started working on the book um where the, ri the original Version, version one of the book was written by Jim Meineke. Um, I reached out to him and said, "Hey, I want to, I want to work on this thing." And he kind of dismissed me. He didn't, he didn't not say no, but I said, "I want to, I want to elevate it to 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 version two. And he goes, "Awesome, Sh show me what you got, and then we'll, we'll talk." And I did, and I, I helped build out basically the first uh, twenty pages of, of that document. So we basically took it from twenty eight to to thirty eight pages, and. Um, and he had done all the hard work on, on the spreadsheets and that, that study guide. He had done all the hard work of the mappings. Um, I just ended up doing a lot of the typing and, and, and rewriting a lot of the, uh, the, the, the concepts for that. Um, I did some cleanup on some of the, uh, on some of the formatting stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there's still some errors in there on, on formatting. I, I need to go back in and fix. Um, and so maybe I'll get like a version 2.0 one or 2.2 here pretty quick um but yeah um once i'd shown him what i was doing he got all excited and he's like he gave me all the source files and then allowed me to go hog wild with it and awesome. and, and, and build awesome. it out and you know uh, I've, a couple of different people have asked me why is it the mango um well i just knew uh, jim had chosen the mango um and i've got a side project to build out a, a pineapple for casp um i've about that effort stalled. I need to go back through and redo that one. Um, but we all know that for the, one of the preeminent study guides for CISSP is the sunflower, which is sunflower dash CISSP.com. Uh, I had nothing to do with that. That was a group of professionals that, that worked on that uh, many years ago. Um, but 
I had found Jim's work and he had labeled it the mango. And um, so I think that's it's just a fruit or seed um, theme that we have going for the different uh, study guides out there. So for those of you who don't know, CGRC, it stands for Certified Governance Risk and Compliance, formerly right. called the CAP from the ISC to squared. And it yep. focuses on it's on government GRC, like federal GRC, which focuses entirely on the NIST 800 risk management framework standard. Uh, it's right now it's the top certification that I know of as far as marketability is concerned for a GRC professional. Um, there's right. other ones out there that I've heard of, but the one that is right now most marketable is the CGRC. I'm I'm hoping that there's some other competition out there as far as certification because any the more certifications that we have that are marketable, that mean when I say market, I mean people know about it, what it is, and stuff like that. Um, the more it helps us out as professionals to use that um, as part of our uh, title. You know, you can go out there and take it and prove that you know that information, and then show that to an employer. So, um, yeah, check it out. It's a free uh, resource for you. Uh, link in description. And um, let me see. I had some other questions for you. I, there's yeah. a ton of people asking me questions here <laughs> on TikTok and stuff. And I'm going to get to you guys in a second. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, I want to ask this question before I answer any of you guys. I see you guys on TikTok, on, on YouTube and stuff. Um, and just get your questions prepped because they're coming. All right. So but my question here, we have a great opportunity to ask somebody who's been in, who's seen three different worlds. You've seen if i'm if i'm reading your linkedin page correctly you were first of all in the in the army as a serviceman yep uh doing in the signal corps so you were it there and then you you were a gs a mm -hmm. civilian yep and you are in the public the private sector yeah so what's the difference between those three and what can you give us like pros and cons of each one of those speaking to our audience, the audience who people are watching us are people who actually want to come in this field. And maybe they don't know the difference between uh, those three sectors and they don't know the pros and cons. These are college students. These are people coming out of high school. Sometimes people coming from another career path and who want to start, but they don't know whether they want to go into the private sector, the public sector, or maybe even the benefits of going into the military. And this is a great opportunity to talk to because I've never been GS before. Yeah, so um, I made some notes and I just glanced over at my notes just to find the right words. Okay. Um, but when you know, when I was in the army, um, you know, you join the army and and you know that that they're going to have an intrusiveness into your your home life um, because it, that's just how it is. You you are property of the U.S. government at that point, and and I accepted that because you know I committed to that lifestyle. Um, and then uh, you know, I got out. I, re I left uh, the military service, um, and worked for a couple different companies. And and said, uh, you know, I, I just hadn't found the right path yet. I hadn't found the right for the way forward yet. And uh, had an opportunity to get go back into the uh, to the GS world, working as a as a um, working with the Air Force at that time. Um, and one of the things that I just felt was that uh, there was still a little bit of rigidity that I was uncomfortable with in the GS world. Um, and to a degree, uh, a resistance against uh, against change in the, in the GS world. Um, I just remember having uh, having to respond to um, requests for my time outside of work hours. Um, and, um, and I wasn't prepared to, to, to wholly support my time outside of work, um, unless it was, you know, actually producing something, producing a product or producing a result. Um, and so basically, you know, I was, I was getting requests to come to work outside of my work hours. Um, and so that that kind of um, that kind of rubbed me raw a little bit, you know, uh, that that intrusiveness into my my personal life, because I, that's not what I signed up for. I signed up to be a professional, signed up to provide a service or you know produce a product, you know, during my assigned work hours. You mean in the private sector? 
No, in the GS. In the GS. Okay, okay. okay. And it's something you kind of expect in the army. Yeah, and I don't want to get into the, the exact details just because it, it, it was it, it was really petty and it was um, me maybe not expressing expressing myself in the most um, adult fashion. But at the end of the day, I was being asked to come to stand around for a dog and pony show, um, if you get the reference, um, yeah. when I wasn't scheduled to to be there that day and we could we could play the old uh mall rats reference or the kevin kevin smith movie reference like it's not even it's not even my day to be, be working um but you know so i was i was still searching for the perfect opportunity um and that opportunity kind of presented itself when i went, returned back to uh, to that post down south and and cleaned up you know all those accounts and what, what that one taught me was that i was I had a lot more leeway. I had a lot more leeway to produce something um, and chase chase uh, a project that I wanted to work on, that I was interested in working on. Um, and I had somebody want to get into an argument with me down there yeah, because I was doing something and I was, I was producing something. And they said, well, you don't even know the, the CCIs. And so uh, you know what I'm talking about when I say yeah. CCIs. And I said, no, you're right. I don't, but I can find them. I know how to, I know how to use this thing called Google. And so <laughs> I did. And what he was trying to articulate, I did not believe to be true because I went and then I went and read the CCIs and he still wanted to argue. And cause we were just, we were quipping over, do we do it this way or do we do it that way? And, and it was, it was a, another silly petty disagreement because I was just trying to be clean. Uh, so you have some of the same politics in civil servant uh, work. Right. All right. And, and then um, and then I went back to the contract world. Um, and then the contract world, let me see what my note was. I, I, Cause I wrote it, it said, full freedom of movement, but comes with job insecurity in that you were responsible for your successes and failures Facts. all at the same time. Facts. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you yeah. know, the one, the one analyst job that we, we discussed earlier, you know, you keep the seat from hitting the ceiling. Um, that contract was going to come to a close. Uh, but at that point I had managed to secure two more certifications uh, and that just opened up the world to my current role, which I've been in for, for two and a half years now. And I just dearly adore everybody that I work with and everybody that I, that I interact with. And my, my entire team is just, you know, spectacular. that's awesome. That's awesome. So, so civil servant, some of the pros is it's more, it's job security still cons. Yes. There's still the political stuff you have to go through and then they expect you to kind of act military, but you're not in the military. Right. Um, so those are kind of the cons and the pros and then private sector, it's it, the pros. You, you can have this great working environment, but it's it. The job security is kind of not there. It, right. Well, if you compare it to civil servant. Yeah. And I, I feel that the government is doing a disservice right now. Um, I know why they're doing it. Uh, I understand the, some of the, the politics behind it. Um, but the GS uh, pay scale and the, the pay scales have for the government schedule, the, the different government schedules, NH or GS, whatever you want to call it. Um, they're just not keeping up. Is it NH now? Well, there's there's multiple. It depends oh, okay. depends on what, what role and what what branch you work for, and, and there's a whole different. I, know I, I don't understand mean. all that either. The the um, GS. I was offered a GS be, when I was um, I was working directly with the GSs, and I was a contractor, and they offered me a position. Pretty much the same thing I was doing, but they were mm -hmm. they were getting away from contractors, and we're going to have all the GS do the contractor work and they told us like the two years out or something like that. So that was good, you know, nice of them to do that rather than just firing us off. And uh, the pay scale was way lower, like 10 K yeah. lower a year, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, damn, you know, I don't. And meanwhile, somebody else is offering me, I just got into CISP and somebody else is offering me 20 K more to go yeah. to this other job. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So I know what you mean by that. Yeah. So, I mean, and it just, it's, you get freedom of movement and you're responsible yes. for your sex, successes and failures. Um, and I think that's what, what we found. Okay. Let me ask, um, let me get to the questions here. Let me see if there's any 
questions here. Somebody said, finally, I'm able to do it. Okay. <laughs> do you have a product that it can be used for A and A? Um, do you have available? Um, have availability for questions. A and A um, assessment. Uh, so this is for assessments. Um, I've got something out there. I've got a book uh, for the NIST 853A that you can check out. It's check it out on Amazon. Um, if you go to go to Amazon and look me up, Convo, just look up Convo Courses. You'll find something. Also, ConvoCourses.net. You'll find some free resources, free downloadables. I've got this whole long list of questions. Haven't done assessments myself, though, so that's some stuff you can do. But you can also get this stuff for free. Um, there's a ton of free um, uh, resources out there that are on government websites um, that will help you out quite a bit. They have downloadable spreadsheets and everything. Um, let me see. Ryan, do you know of any resources that they can use to do a and Type yeah, I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now. I'd have to to poke around a little bit, but I know that you've done those books, and I know that they they're out there. I've I've seen your 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 list on Amazon. It's 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 quite exhaustive. I mean, you've done a lot of work in preparing a lot of that stuff. Yeah, still still uh, trying to prank, crank out some more stuff. Okay, Anthony says, uh, "Hi, Bruce. Can you demonstrate a scenario to show me how to execute poli a policy and procedures?" I can do better than that. So I've got uh, some downloadable resources that you can use to uh, help you out to kind of pump the primer on if you like, he basically gives you a template, like a template that you can download and say, OK, this is what I want to do for a policy and procedure. But a scenario, that's what you want, a scenario in which you would need uh, to execute a policy and procedure, demonstrate a scenario. Hmm. Well, any organization that's handling any very important information is going to need some sort of policy and procedure. And the reason why is because if you're handling a good example would be, I don't know, the post office. So they're handling people's uh, private information. So PII information where they're handling your first name, your last name associated with your with your address and, and sometimes even phone numbers and stuff. So in that case, this organization must protect your information. It's a law. It's a it's a federal law. Like you've got Privacy Act of 1974. You've got, I don't know, FISMA. You've got all kinds of um, systems out, uh, laws out there that are passed that this organization has to you has to apply to protect your information. So how do they do that? A policy is the best way to do that. So that's a scenario in which you would need to have a policy. The procedures back up the policy. The procedures say, OK, any mail carrier or any civil servant who uses, who has to interact with the privacy information has to do X, Y and Z in order to protect your information, the public's information. So that's a scenario in which you would need to um, use a policy and procedure. And I hope I'm answering that question. I'm understanding what you mean by that. You know, one thing I, I'd want to jump on there, Bruce, is that, yeah, you know, and this is something that we we grappled with recently is is what's the difference between a plan, a policy, a procedure, you know, and, and just defining what you want, because we kept all of our policies very high level, um, one page, Mac, you know, basically one page right. or maybe a page and a half policy, mm -hmm. kept them no more than two pages on our policies, and then we would write more descriptive plans we took what i wouldn't say we took what nist provides as the examples for the families but we made sure that it was it, it balanced against what nist describes for all of all the different plans right and then from there we've been working steadily over the last um you know a couple of years to to build all of our desktop instructions which we we leverage our um our ITSM, uh, which is ServiceNow, to build out all of our, our desktop instructions in, in, in the form of KB articles that have the step-by-step -step instructions. And so that's how you would ex execute a, uh, you know, a policy or procedure, um, yes. procedures within a policy. And yeah, to piggyback on, on what Ryan's saying about the policy being broad. And the reason why you do that is because you might have an organization has several departments and the HR department has to meet that policy. And then the IT department has to meet that policy. So it has to be broad enough so that it accommodates both of their missions. Um, so that's why you make it broad. And then the procedures are very specific. So that one would be specific to the HR department or specific to the IT department. 
So that's one scenario that you could use to uh, as an example of why you would need a policy and a procedure. And great, great uh, answer there, Ryan, on uh, the difference between a policy and a procedure. OK, let me see if there's anything on TikTok. Any questions? I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom here. And somebody says, I generally write or revise policies based on specific laws and regulations. That was a great explanation. Exactly. So the, the policy is based off of uh, of really it's based off of standards and the standards are based off of off of uh, laws, you know. So great. Uh, that's from Big Gay Mike. Thanks, Big Gay. <laughs> TikTok's crazy, man. I uh, love it. Okay, let me see. I'm going to ans answer another question. Somebody says, um, must I have a computer for me to start my cybersecurity career? What do you think, Ryan? Do I mean, they have to have a computer to start their cybersecurity. We, we know that one of the, the greatest uh, Russian programmers um, only got like one hour of computer time per day. Um, and he, uh, so he was at the center of the Dane Rauscher discovery of the micro trading scandal of 2011, somewhere around there. He, <laughs> he, he was a programmer for Dane Rausch, uh, investment company, uh, RBC bank, Ro Royal bank of Canada, I believe. Um, yeah out of Canada and people were beating them to the trade because what they were doing was literally trying to set up their computers as close as possible, physically as close as possible to the exchanges so that when they saw the big trades coming in from, uh, from distant locations like Canada, they were beating them to the market through the micro, uh, I mean, by, by milliseconds, we're talking right. milliseconds here. And so I just remember that guy's background being that he, he would go home, he would write all his code in hand, you know, hand write it out. <laughs> That's crazy, man. Because this was, this was part of his story. Um, and he would, he would just wait for that, that time that he could get on the computers when he had one hour per day and he would just type all his code out. And, wow, and I just remember, so the answer is yes, you probably do need a computer, but we're talking, this guy's this guy's experience was many years ago, um, and we've got such great options out there nowadays that are so cheap. Whether it's a Raspberry Pi and 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 learning how to build something from scratch that way, um, or you know just using a, a I guess the, they've got the Chromebooks are, are fairly are fairly inexpensive, um, and anytime you can get on screen is is, is screen time is is what I would say to that. I would let me add to this. Um, so he says, must I have a computer for me to start my computer, my science, my cybersecurity career? And I'm going to say yes. And here's but here's the here's the catch. It doesn't have to be your computer. And first of all, it should be uh, focus on information technology first, because that's the foundation of everything we do. So what you could do is you could use your phone. I mean, you could start with your phone. If you have a phone, if you don't have a phone, I mean, you could the library has computers. You They have free resources there. Do you have um, if you are overseas, they have Internet cafes. You could use other computers to start your journey of getting the knowledge, getting the basic information technology. Uh, uh, common body of knowledge is really where you want to start. And at some point, you're going to have to get your hands on a computer to, to tear it apart, to mess around with it, to do to do you're going to have to touch a computer at some point but in the very very beginning you, yes you do need one but you can use other people's computers you know um and, and and in the example of the russian uh the russian guy i mean he was using other people's computers to get to to do what he needed to do so yes you do but it doesn't have to be your own okay let me see other questions here um Somebody in Big Game Mike says uh, you'll need access to one somewhere to develop the skills and knowledge. Yep, that's right. Correct. I agree. Uh, let me see. Um, somebody, okay, somebody piggybacked on uh, what you said about CISSP. They said, my challenge with taking the CISSP is finding the time and the energy. What would you say to that, Ryan? Well, I'm looking for another question. My my solution was to, instead of drawing it out over a long period of time and, and potentially spending more time on the energy, I, I did a big push to to do it and, and spend spend short amount of time in terms of weeks, three weeks. But that's all I did 
for for three day three weeks. I was working probably close to eighteen hours a day, tr studying, internalizing material, and and I, I devoted three weeks to it uh, in that regard. Um, I know Bruce, you you said you went the other way. You you expanded your your timeline out to a year. <laughs> But but right. then you, you might probably had more micro transactions than that's I that's exactly right. That's exactly what I did. Okay, I'm looking for another question. Ashley works as uh, one that um, ACAS and STIG requirements. Okay, it's not really a question. Let me see which which resources did you use? Okay, here's a good one. Tabitha Wood says says uh, I guess this is this. I'll use this one uh, for both of us. Um, which resources did you use for Security Plus? Um, I mean, that was so long ago. I don't remember what I used back then. I, I just searched around, and I think I may have found some things that I'm not even supposed to mention, so I won't. Because <laughs> um, I, I didn't understand back then um, the proper way of, of approaching it. Um, what I do know is that I'm, I'm working with um, a friend to get um, a young man certified. And I do want to have him get certified in A plus, net plus, and sec plus. And so I've basically developed my own study plan for a lot of these things. Um in searching out, finding out, you know, the, the exam outline, finding, you know, because you can get it from CompTIA for free. You, you don't even have to put in correct information for your email address. You just put in information, but you can get to their exam outline that has all of the exam objectives in there. And then you could you utilize like an AI or, or another resource to help you understand those basic concepts. What is a magnetic tape drive? What is, you know, for A plus? Um, what is what is the CIA triad for SEC plus? And then a an AI will tell you exactly what a CIA triad is. And then you can take that information, you can copy and paste it into a, a Word document for and build your own study guide, or you could my recommendations, you take that information and transcribe it word for word, type it out personally, um, and build your own study guide that way. And so you've got the Jason Dion's on um, Udemy. You've got uh, training materials on uh, YouTube that are readily available. Uh, I could go to YouTube right now and find, you type in Security Plus, and you could find dozens and dozens of channels with the material out there. And so you could you could listen to the hours of a video and take the key concepts and compare it against the exam outline that Security Plus provides free of charge that they, they tell you the answers. They just don't tell you what the questions are going to be. Um, and so you could, you could meld those two products together to get, to get to uh, your own study guide. Um, and then I would go to Udemy and, and find the practice exams that support your learning objectives and take as many of them as you can. Um, here's the one thing I haven't mentioned yet. When I take ex practice exams on on Udemy, I then open, I, I've got a big monitor to my left, you're right, um, but I've got a big monitor and I put the practice exam results on the left-hand side and I open up a blank Word document and I I write or I, I type out every single question that I took. After I, after I take 50 questions, I get the results, good, bad, ugly, doesn't matter, and I write every single question out. And I only write the correct answer. And what that does is that reinforces the positive answer uh, for that question. And then sometimes you, the questions will be written in a negative. And so what I mean by that is a question may say, which one of, the, uh, which one of these things is not what I'm looking for? And so then what you have to do in that case, when you get to one of those questions, you have to rewrite it in the positive to reinforce positive things for yourself. These, I would rewrite the question as these three things are part of this thing that I was looking for. And so that's one way to turn a, a negative question into a positive so that you're not reinforcing negatives in your brain. Um, and that's just kind of how I've, I've always approached um, these these exams and then what i'll end up doing or at, what i will end up with at the end of my study period is 
thousands of questions that have been rewritten five different ways. And I've reinforced the material in my, into my primitive brain that way. Yes. Um, what did I study? I I've taken the security plus twice. I took the old one, the one that doesn't expire. Um, yeah. And then I took the, the newer one. I had to teach security plus for this IS, uh, ISSA Colorado. This was a long time ago, but uh I re so I retook the new test and um, in the past both. Um, so what I used was kind of what Ryan's talking about, which I would buy a book, 20 bucks, you know, 15 bucks, whatever. I'd have the physical copy there and that I'd write out all of the most important pieces, parts of it. And so I was kind of transcribing it so that I can understand what's uh, what's going on. And some parts of it, I, I understood. I've been doing it so long that I just knew it. But the parts that I struggled with, and I'll just give you one example of one I struggle with is, is um, crypto, crypt cryptography. I always, I always struggle with that one. So I'll write out all the, the cryptographic um, modules or something. And then what, uh, I, to this day, I don't remember how many, <laughs> I don't, I can't tell you uh, the details of it. I just, it just does not, I can't retain it. <laughs> just, I have to look it up every time, but that I struggle with it. So what I would do is I would write it out. I'd write the, an, a question about that particular crypto, cryptographic module that's, that's uh, obsolete. And then I'd write the answers. Um, so, and then I would study for my notes. And so that's how I studied. And then after I was done with the entire book, I would go out and find questions um, and they just go over them over and over and over again. Um, and, and these days, what you could use is, um, is chat GPT and it'll generate some questions for you. Now you gotta be careful with it. Cause sometimes it'll hallucinate and yep. make and get the wrong answers. But, uh, that's why you gotta use more than one resource is what I would say. Okay. Let me see. See any more, more questions here. Um, Nathan. Okay. Um, Nate, maybe you can answer this one, Ryan. I, I don't feel comfortable answering this one, but he says, what's your guys' thoughts on the CMMC, CCA, CCP? Uh, for, this is not my specialty. Um, I, I'm mostly NIST 800. Um, I know it's a C, CMMC is kind of like a stripped down version. I'm thinking of the NIST uh, 800-171. Yeah, I, I a lot of our two different things. A lot of our... Um colleagues are, are aiming for CMMC when they're not a, uh, a government system. Right. Um, it, Cause it is stripped down, um, but it can work. I don't know anything about these exams per se, um, but I know that, like I said, our, a lot of our colleagues who um, live in a different world um, are aiming for CMMC versus RMF implementation for, you know, framework. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. C CMMC is, um, is for organizations that are not, they're not directly federal. They're not directly federal information systems, but they're right. organizations that work for the federal government. So they have to have some kind of a certification to allow them to continue to process or transmit, um, that information. Right. I hope I'm, I don't know. It's not my, <laughs> my specialty. So, all right, Larry, Hey, Larry. Okay. Larry, the, the project manager guy, um, he says, and thanks for the 20 bucks, Larry. I appreciate it. He says, um, how would you, how would you suggest vetting study resources? And he says, I know Ryan provided a great resource to study the CGRC and it is a trusted resource, but how do we know what sources are better than others and how how many are needed or maybe too much you know the one thing i would say about that is that um i'll, I'll grab it I'm, I'm reaching around as i did by this one uh for the cgrc uh written by paul howard i actually tried to get in touch with uh mr howard uh but he's fully retired now he he left colorado springs a couple years ago and uh, oh, i didn't even know he was here <laughs> yeah and he hasn't looked back uh, he's fully retired and um doesn't work in that lane uh but we know the book 
was based on revision one. And that's what really drove me to try and rewrite the CGRC to, to incorporate revision two and get it brought up to speed. Um, I think after a time, you just start to develop a sense of what, what study resources are, are, are legitimate because there are some that are, are out there that aren't because you'll, you'll, you'll search through Udemy for a particular, particular course that you're chasing. Um, and I, I've found some that I've immediately, I've taken, I've opened up one exa practice exam or I've opened up some of the study material and I've said, this is not worth the, the $20 that I've paid for it. Um, and I've immediately turned it back over to, to you to me and said, I'm, this is not what I need. Um, but there are ones that if you like anything, if you're, if you're buying a car, you go and look at the reviews, you know, um, you have to take reviews with a grain of salt, but we also know that people, some, some people will write honest reviews and say, this was, this is almost there. This, this class is almost there. It's about a 90% solution. Recommend you purchasing it, knowing that, you know, you may have to fill in that, that last 10%. Um, but just read the reviews and, and find what works for you. Um, like I said, I, I, I bought one course and immediately realized the, the, the person who wrote it didn't have the strongest grasp on English as a, as a second language. And, and that hindered my ability to, to work quickly and efficiently with the material that I was presented. So uh, I turned that course back over to Udemy and said, you know, just didn't miss the mark. And um, I immediately found another course that I purchased that did exactly what I needed it to do. And that was provide me as, as many practice, ex, uh, practice exam questions uh, as possible so that I could take all that material and build it back into my own personal study guide. Yeah, and I would add to this. Um, so I, I'm constantly learning all kinds of fields. Um, and when it comes to information technology and cybersecurity, what I found is it's kind of like a bell curve. Like there's, there's some stuff that's terrible, really, really bad stuff, right? And uh, like Ryan said, sometimes like I'll, I'll get a book or I'll, I'll get a course and it's just, it's just not good, you know? Um, and then there's most people are in the middle, like most average. It's just average stuff. It's all the common body of knowledge stuff. It's great. And then some stuff is is outstanding. Like it's so good. Um, how do you know? How do you know which ones are good and which ones are bad? And unfortunately, you can't. You're not going to be 100 percent right. Right. There's you always if you study a lot, especially if you read a lot, you, you're taking in a lot of content. You're going to experience terrible, terrible stuff. Um, but one thing you can do is if there's a review section, don't look at just the fives and don't look at just the ones, you know, don't look at just the zeros. Look at that stuff in between the, the guys who are giving you three, four stars, the guys who are not giving 100 percent because those guys are going to tell you what's wrong with the course. They're going to say, well, you know, it was good, but there were grammar errors here. They were, they're going to say that kind of stuff. Right. And if you could live with those threes and those fours, that'll give you some idea of whether you want to deal with, because there's no perfect course, right? There's just something, what it'll be the good stuff that's on that other edge of the bell curve, that really good stuff is going to be stuff that resonates with you. It just resonates with you for a reason. They, they teach it great. And it just like, you understand it, a, a light goes off, you know, um, nothing's perfect. Uh, another thing you can do is uh, something. One of the most important things I learned in in school: critical reading. Um, that's everything you take in. Like take it with a grain of salt. You know, don't don't believe anything a hundred percent. Use different resources to validate the information you have. Like, don't just rely on one source. Rely on multiple sources. And this goes for anything in life. Don't just take people's word for it. You know, sometimes people think they're right and they're they're off by some facts or their their perspective is skewed. But if you take on information like you can enough information, you can then evaluate where the truth lies, where the facts, where they where they stand. What's the truth here? So those are a couple things that I use to evaluate whether something is fake or something is something is great. Uh, is use those uh, what people have said and also critical critical reading is super important. I hope that helps. Uh, let me see. 
Here's another. Let me get something from uh, before I ask more, answer more questions from YouTube. Let me answer. I'm not going to keep you guys too much longer. We've been going for one hour, so I'm going to take a few more questions. Um, somebody said, where should I start? I need more context. But uh, let's let's tackle that one. Where should a person start? If a person was trying to get into this field from another field, or maybe you're coming from college, or maybe it's none of that. You just, you are, uh, you are uh, like myself, you are a grunt and you're trying to go into another field. Where do you start? I would say start where you are. And what that means is whatever skill set you have right now, wherever you're at, start where you are. Maybe, maybe it has absolutely nothing to do with information technology and cybersecurity. Maybe you have a lot of free time. Use that free time. Whatever you have, use it. Um, Ryan, what would you say to somebody who's coming from, um, I don't know, the healthcare industry? And they're trying to come into our industry. Well, I mean, we know that that they've got an incredible privacy requirements in the healthcare industry, and then those guys get that stuff beaten beaten to their brain from day one. Um, so, you know, I would start with maybe some learning about you know privacy issues and and start thinking about what what are the different standards that control privacy you know what what is the hipaa act and how does that apply to a, a computer information system you know and what controls might need to be in, in placed technical controls that are in placed on a on a computer information system um, you somebody coming from the health healthcare industry might know help desk operations better than they think they might and they and which is customer service at the end of the day um so maybe they they want to want to aim, aim for like a help desk type position to to build out their their knowledge of the basic terms that that our industry is built on excellent you know, excellent uh, exactly exactly start where you are so you in the healthcare industry you might have you have an advantage over myself who has very little exposure to working directly inside of the health, healthcare industry you know terms that i don't um you know, so that will give you a, a uh, an advantage of having that HIPAA stuff beaten into your head. Um, let me see. I've got a couple of other questions here. Um, let me see. Oh, here's one. Here's one. Um, somebody said on TikTok, how do you feel about a network engineer, uh, about network engineer to network security? I mean, it's just an obvious next step in my yeah. mind. I used to do network engineering and we had to pay attention to things like uh, port security or um, protecting the, the switch, uh, doing certain things in the configuration to protect the, uh, the the routers and stuff like that. What do you think, Ryan? Absolutely. Um, there's all types of cyber cyber guys, and um, yep. and that was one of the thoughts I as I was driving back from Denver this morning, um, preparing mentally, thinking about different thoughts. Uh, I'm not a network guy. I know some network concepts uh, because I've been exposed to them over the years. Um, I've seen um, VLANs being constructed, built, and, and shut down. Um, but I'm not a network guy. Uh, there are guys who are, and we need you in cybersecurity. We need network security guys Absolutely. to come in and, and, and tell us, hey, you've got way too many VLANs. you got way too many ports open, blah, 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 blah. We need, we need network guys to grow into network security engineers. Um, maybe not necessarily a cyber guy, but that's we we need all sorts of flavors in cybersecurity in general. A cybersecurity Absolutely. team is, is this is the sum of all of its parts. Exactly. I know how to write policies. I know how to sit and knock out five page documents or 20 page documents or or 60 page studies because that's one of my strengths. But if you're asking me to be a network security guy, I cannot do that for you adequately exactly exactly um so we've got another question it's going to be one of my last questions i think unless there's some stuff here in TikTok, which is not a lot um coming from larry and larry says does ryan have experience working with both the private sector and the public sector yes he does pros and cons of cyber in both okay that's the first question and he says does he feel that either being a PM project manager in cyber is a position in need or does uh, does having a PM skills help? Um, so what I would answer to that is, yes, I have worked for other other companies in, in a cyber uh, role. 
um, at one point was helping to my the guys that worked with me and, and for me in, in the SOC were, were monitoring both physical uh, security perimeters and electronic security perimeters for uh, for the power plants all across the United States from Southern California all the way up into Maine. Uh, we were we were monitoring power plants all over the United States and, and monitoring those perimeters uh, for our clients. Um, and so the, the cons really are when you're in the public sector, you may not have the same budget that you would have working for a government. Um, the government really prioritize, prioritizes cyber and they fund cyber appropriately. Um, and that's and that's a good thing. Um, you may not feel like you're getting funded appropriately, but you are uh, getting funded to a degree that could be echelons above what might exist in the civilian world. Um, and then there's economies of scale with that that come with working with the government too, because they have resources that just don't exist in the, in the public sector for for cheap. Um, and we may just be able to send a, a memorandum to a, to a specific office and get their support for you know a, a small amount of money um, that would cost exponentially more in the, in the civilian world. Um, as far as yeah, we've got technical project managers that that we work with on a regular basis um, that have to have an, a general understanding of of what cyber do, is and does, and so. We, we have those kinds of roles and they are, they are, they do exist out there. Um, and they do require PMPs. Um, so a common combination that you will see is a PMP and CISM. So from ISACA, you'll see their, their, um, uh, information security manager certificate. Um, and that's, a, that's a popular combination for those guys because it gives them the bare bones knowledge of, of security that they would need. Um, to operate within within our program. Wow, what was that? Was that certification you just said? The ISACA CISM. So the ISACA CISM has been described to me. Here's another resource I haven't mentioned yet. Certification station on Discord. Um, I am absolutely a fan of that that wow. Discord channel. Yeah, just learned something new. <laughs> because I, and I'm 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 heavy in there. Um, because there's always a team of people that are on we're willing to answer any questions you might have um the guys in that in that group um describe cism as being 90 percent of isc2's issmp holy shit so i didn't know I did, that so here, here here's here's where where my my life kind of went off the rails uh in the last couple of months um i, I did lose a loved one um uh, my sister's husband tragically passed away. Um, and you know, uh, I would, I, what my, my study plan for the ISSMP was to take CISM, um, a week ahead of ISSMP. Um, but what I failed to do is I failed to get ISACA's, uh, questions, answers, and explanations database. Um, and that cost a couple hundred bucks. I think it was like 199 or something like that. Um, it was either one ninety nine or two ninety nine. I can't remember the exact cost, um, but ISACA has a way of asking a question that ISC two might ask in a different way, and their answer may be slightly different than IS, ISC two's uh, preferred answer for that that scenario or that problem. Um, but uh, you know, I lost uh, I lost my my family member uh, the day that I was supposed to take the CISM exam examination. Right. So. Um, I came back from helping out my sister and uh, I took the ISSMP, uh, which is the information system security management professional um, concentration of the CISP. They're trying to break it out into its own okay. uh, certification. Um, and when I took that exam, I knew er what every single question was asking me. There was, there was none of the am ambiguity that I felt that I, that existed in uh, CISSP. Um, I passed that exam. I passed that certification. But when I finally got the authorization to take retake the CISM that I missed, um, unfortunately, I didn't make it. But I was pretty close in all the areas, um, and so I will utilize their QAEs. It's called it's questions, answers, explanations. Um, next time I take it, um, I just wasn't prepared because of everything that was going on in the last month, last two months, really. Yeah, it happens. I mean, something similar happened to me when I was trying to take the uh, one of the Cisco certifications and failed it. 
you just had a lot of stuff going on, so it happens, you know. Yeah, but sorry all, for your loss, man. Um, yeah. We all have our our failures, you know, with these certifications. Not everyone's going to come out on the first time, and sometimes you just got to get a peek behind the the curtain to to understand, uh, you know, what you need to do to prepare for it better the next time. The yeah, it was rough. Well, actually, what you know, I, and I, I do. I want to give them credit because they do their own thing. And um, I, I never felt once that I didn't understand any of the questions on the CISM. I just, um, I didn't reference the the QAE and that's, that's on me. And everybody said, you do need to read the QAE or have access to the QAE. And I didn't. This is my last question. Uh, Cause we're, we're an hour and 20 minutes in. Um, so I don't want to keep Ryan too long. Um, uh, Brandon says, what would be the best next step to become an ISSO, an ISO, after obtaining a Security Plus? I'll let you take the first crack at this one. You know, and I don't, I don't know if I've got a good answer for that one. Um, I think it, that's more of a right place at the right time kind of scenario. Um, there are government programs that have a notorious reputation for being ISSO factories. People come in um into these different government programs they do a year or two and then they they self-proclaim themselves to be issos and then they 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 move on to bigger and better better paying roles um <laughs> what's that it happens a lot <laughs> yeah and um and i i think it's it's all about being able to understand rmf and um and and operate within that that framework and so i would i would look for those roles that are are like are doing like audit type work, you know, entry level type of audit work um, that that really lend themselves to being um, to, to moving into an ISSO role. Um, I would say that to be an ISSO, uh, it would it would really help you to understand the risk management framework. So I would recommend CGRC as a certification. Um, which you could take after after obtaining security plus yeah okay yeah i i would like to to add to what ryan's saying because i agree so brandon listen man don't don't pigeonhole yourself just to become an, an iso so iso is an information an information system security officer and specifically for the government so a grc person remember grc stands for governance risk and compliance and that it, it's not specifically for any one standard, even though the CGRC focuses entirely on the NIST 800. But that said, this, the term GRC stands for governance, risk and compliance. That's across many different industries. You can be a GRC person in HIPAA, uh, which is for the healthcare industry. You could be a CGRC for the retail sector doing PCI DSS. You could be and the list goes on and on. The main thing you need to focus on if you want to prepare yourself for becoming a GRC person in general is to learn the standards. Just like Ryan said, um, the standards, he said he mentioned CGRC. That's an expert in um, in NIST 800. That's knowing the standards, what federal information systems are supposed to have in terms of getting prepared for uh, the NIST 800, uh, uh, knowing how to apply an organization applies the NIST 800 controls, like what's the, what are they supposed to do uh, in, in all the steps of the NIST 837, that kind of thing. The more you know about the standards, the more it's going to help you to, to be a great ISO or GRC for any other industry. So that's what, that's what I would say. I mean, a Security Plus is a great first step. That's, that's awesome. It's very marketable, but kind of expand your horizons. Like if you know the NIST 800, uh, think about doing ISO 27001, which is an international standard. Think about doing uh, PCI compliance. Any of those things on your resume and knowing those, being familiar with how that stuff works is going to help you out quite a bit. All right. And I think that that's it, guys. Um, thanks, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks, Larry, for the 20 bucks, man. I really appreciate it. All you professionals who jump on here week after week. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan, for jumping in here and helping me out with this. This was this was great, man. This is the first time I've done it like this before. 
Hey, Bruce, the one thing I, I've said is you don't know how many conversations you and I have had. <laughs> I mean, nobody may have been listening to what I had to say, but I, I've, I've been sitting here listening to you for a couple months now, and I just I just think the the world of what you're doing and what you're trying to accomplish. I I, I got it, and I, I just wanted to help out however I could. If you guys you know sat here and listened to me for an hour, <laughs> thanks a lot. I'd not have had and better stuff to be doing, but <laughs> Ryan's uh, connections are in the description. Um, if you guys are watching me on TikTok, go to go to Combo Courses on YouTube, on Facebook, and you'll see all of his links there. I've got his LinkedIn page. Uh, I'm sure he'd, he'd um, happily invite you there. And then he's got a free book that's going to walk you through and guide you through getting that CGRC certification. So check that out. And um, if you guys, if there's any other professionals who are interested to jump on here, I'm open to it. Um, we'll coordinate and you can jump on here. And um, appreciate everybody. That's it. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks again, man. I hope we do this again another time, man. Appreciate you. Sounds good. Thank Later, you. guys.